It is Tuesday, August 10th. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Today we are talking with experts from two area public health departments on what we can expect in the next coming months. Their predictions on what challenges lie ahead and what we all need to do to stay safe. So do not adjust your TV. Dr. Stites will be back tomorrow and we're going to get to reporter questions here in just a minute. So hang on the line because Dr. Hawkinson is in the middle of a very important call right now. Duty calls, but he's going to join me here in just a moment. So please stay with us, but we're going to turn to our guests. We're just going to jump into it. Both of us, uh, both of them are joining us virtually today. Dr. Rex Ar Archer, he is the former director of KCMO Health Department, and Julianne Van Loo, director of Unified Government of Wyandotte County and KCK Public Health. We are so glad you are both joining us, and we're going to get to you in just a minute because... Dr. Hawkinson just walked in. Are you ready or did I just, no. <laughs> you're not ready? No. Oh. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Do you want to get to the COVID count or do you want us to come back with you? Yeah, I can use the COVID count. Sorry, okay. we were doing a um, physician update for our physicians here at the health system. So That's okay. You can just get ready right on I'm air. Done That's okay. Right now. Um, you know, our cases have gone up. Um, they could be better. Again, we, about 10 days, or sorry, over the weekend or the beginning of the weekend, we had had about 32 active infections. Right now we have 43 active infections with 18 ICU patients. Uh, we, there was a problem with the data collection today and the, um, the application, so we don't know how many are on the vent, but we know that uh, yesterday we had a large proportion on the ventilator. And unfortunately, Hayes is seeing an increase in their uh, patients too. They have 10 active infections and two recoveries. So, they are seeing an increase as well. I was going to get to reporter questions. Do you need a minute or do you want to jump in with those? Yeah, I need a minute. Okay, you take a minute. We'll get back with you. Okay, so Dr. Archer, um, you recently retired. So congratulations on that. 23 years. That's a long time. How has this transition been for you, especially during a pandemic? Uh, it's obviously been a challenge. Um, my passion has always been in public health. I'm just moving from uh, a public health director position from a government standpoint to teaching of uh, medical students and others to kind of raise the next generation of folks that can work to protect the public's health. So I'm, I've joined Kansas City University College of Osteopathic Medicine and uh, uh, we're, we're gearing up for kind of that next generation. But uh, luckily the metro area still has the all the other health department directors and uh, the new um, interim director for our Kansas City Health Department, Frank Thompson, has been with me 22 years, so uh, everybody's still in good hands. So this, I want to ask you, while we have you, the CDC changed recommendations regarding mask wearing for fully vaccinated individuals. Tell us why. So when the recommendations had come out originally, this was really before the Delta variant had taken hold, and as people have gotten used to hearing this is two to three times as contagious as the previous variant so yes um, folks that were fully vaccinated um, with the previous uh, variant um, we're not really seeing much breakthrough infections uh, at all um, the unique thing with this delta virus is that we are seeing breakthrough infections folks aren't dying or being hospitalized or certainly not in the icu if they've been fully vaccinated. But ironically, we're seeing folks that don't have really any symptoms, fully vaccinated, that are shedding as much virus as folks that haven't been vaccinated. So that's why we're recommending everybody to wear masks. Um, the chief medical officers and public health got together a couple of weeks ago, and we were already saying for folks that have other challenges with their immune systems, if they've been organ transplants or cancer or other types of diseases where you're at higher risk to become severely ill with COVID and you may not have built as good of an immune system from vaccines, we were already recommending them to wear a mask anyway to give themselves extra protection. The reason that we also want everybody to wear a mask now in indoor settings is there are folks that have tried to protect themselves, have got vaccinated, but may still rely on us keeping the virus away from them by wearing masks. Dr. Archer, you were on a radio show recently, uh, last month actually, and you said, and I'm quoting you, and I hope I have this right, there's gonna be a huge blow up in September in Kansas City. I wanna know what prompted you to give that warning and do you still feel that way? 
Uh, I still feel that way, although there are some things being put in place that may reduce the size of that blow up. Um, and the reason that I was concerned and continue to be concerned is this Delta variant is so much more contagious and folks that even have very mild symptoms are shedding fairly high levels of virus. So that's a concern. The second obviously is that most of the mask um, compliance of people wearing masks had kind of gone away and people were having a lot of fatigue around social distancing and the last, uh, which I think is one of the most critical reasons why I think this fall is dangerous, is that many of the school systems were um, being pressured by a small number of, uh, I think, very ill-informed parents to not have masks mandated in the schools. And we know that in years where there haven't been masks worn, influenza uh, just takes off in the schools and actually spreads in the schools to the rest of the community. The original coronavirus um, was not as contagious for kids. We were not as worried about them in the schools, uh, but this virus appears to be much more contagious. And if schools don't mandate mask wearing for everybody, we're gonna have a real problem this fall. Julianne, you're in Wyandotte County. What challenges are you facing? Well, gosh, well, we certainly have our cohort of those um, loud parents as well that Dr. Rex mentioned. Um, I think, you know, we're worried that there are going to be a couple of our smaller school districts that aren't going to make that mask mandate happen. A couple of them still meet within the next week before a school resumes here shortly. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Archer mentioned, we are extremely worried about what comes out of those school settings. They can literally be hot boxes for infection if they do not have the right controls in place. Um, and we forget that there are teachers who are immunocompromised who are in those same classrooms. These kiddos go home to grandparents and parents who are potentially immunocompromised as well. And so we can't think of schools as being in a silo. They are part of the network and the ecosystems of our communities. And we have to be serious about the fact that what happens there has repercussions for the rest of us. All right, both of you stay right there, please. We're gonna bring in Dr. Hawkins in because we wanna get to some reporter questions. I think he's all buttoned up. You've had a little coffee? Doing good? Yeah, I had coffee early in the morning, but I had, it was that meeting that put me back. All right, that's all right. We had to give that update to our own physicians, so we have to keep even our our own employees. Right, you have employees. other duties. And I have to say, Megan and Christy are giving you a shout out this morning. They say they love their Dr. Hawkinson. They just wanna make sure you're doing okay. So yep. so we love to hear that. Okay, so we have a, a couple of media questions I wanna get to, and if anybody's on the line, we'll get to those here in just a moment. But um, Donna uh, over at Channel 9 wants to know, she says, Turner kids are back to school today. Do doctors have a message for students and staff as this school year begins? What's your big message? Yeah, you know, I think we had our great uh, pediatric experts on yesterday, and I think they gave the best messages, and that is, you know, continuing to mask. Um, we do know vaccination helps. Uh, vaccination is the major foundation to which we are going to be able to stop this disease and keep people safe. Um, but we know that there is that Swiss cheese type model, if you will, where it is a number of different um, uh, protocols and systems that you have to help s prevent the spread just because we had heard uh, our guests just say you know the kids yes more than likely they are going to be okay but if you have a large number of kids infected you are still going to have that small percentage who are going to get very ill and go to the hospital but you are still going to be able to bring that home you're going to be able to bring that home to caregivers maybe some people who are more at risk of severe disease so it's very important to continue to do those things that we know work and that is number one vaccination if you're eligible anybody 12 and over is eligible and should be getting the vaccine and if you're if you're a child or if you're a parent you know and understand that if you give your child that vaccine then that way they will stay well and they are more more than likely not going to be pulled out of participation of extracurricular activities such as sports or band or anything of that nature but you are also going to help protect uh, the rest of the family maybe some of those caregivers and then again for those adults in the school whether it's uh, the counselors or the teachers or the administrators you need to keep them well as well so that you can keep the schools open and so making sure all of your staff and all of those adults in that school are vaccinated is going to be the other 
apart. And then, of course, continued masking now, especially with the surge and the increased number of cases and hospitalizations that we have seen, and unfortunately, what Springfield had to go through as well. So doing all of those things, doing the things that were done last year in the schools to keep the schools open and keep everybody safe, and then, of course, vaccination is going to be, those are the main things that we can do. Dr. Archer, you touched on it a little bit, but what's your insight and your message for school staff, students, parents? Our children really, in many cases, struggled last year because uh, virtual learning is often not ideal. And we need to find ways to keep our kids in school um, it puts less stress on the parents who then have kids home that are either ill or have been quarantined because of exposure. Um, so all the way around, it's the right thing to do. Uh, do I like wearing a mask? No, but you do it to protect others and sometimes to protect yourself. And so um, I, I think that's the big, big message here is our kids deserve to have a year where they can really get in and learn, and we need to do everything we can to help them. The other part is RNA viruses mutate. Influenza, coronavirus, the longer we let this hang around, the more that it creates problems for our hospitals with bed capacity um, and, and staffing capacity for those beds where folks that need other procedures can't get them because they're, the beds are tied up with coronavirus patients. We just need to keep the pressure on and encourage everybody to get vaccinated and to wear masks. If we do both of those, as doctor said, if you think about that Swiss cheese model where you've got all those cuts of Swiss cheese, the more things we put in place the less the virus can get through and the better off we'll be overall. It also hurts our local economy and it hurts people that are uh, marginally employed right now because we can't get out and do some of the things that we need to do if this thing takes off in the fall. Dr. Hawkins, Jason with the Topeka Capital Journal has a question about air quality yeah. and some concerns about the western wildfires that are affecting air quality here in Kansas. And with the variant surging, how do you know if those scratchy throats, I know my kid's got one, she's been coughing for days. Um, how do you know the difference between COVID and just bad air quality? Um, can you just give some insight on the symptoms and what we should know? When should we get tested if it continues? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if it does continue more than 48 hours, really, to get tested, uh, it, it's so hard to tell right now. And we have the same question with allergies, although certainly I think allergy symptoms are quite different than if the air quality is bad and maybe you're having a scratchy throat from that. But I think if there's always any doubt, and especially if you are going to be interacting with others outside of your household or outside of your bubble, I think it's important to go get tested. Um, and I think that would be the simplest answer. If there's any doubt, just go get tested. Hey, Julianne, I want to ask you about the, the new mask mandate in Wyandotte County. Why was that so necessary where you all are? What are you seeing? Sure, in, in Wyandotte County, unfortunately, we're just seeing uncontrolled community spread. CDC has deemed us a high uh, rate of spread across the county as it has most of the counties in the broader metro region. Um, and so we are just really concerned about the fact that even though people are coming in to be vaccinated in small numbers, that pays off in two to four weeks when they reach that uh, immune response from that vaccine. What masks do is offer us an opportunity to intervene right now here today. And so again, it's going back to that Swiss cheese model where the vaccines are the long-term answer to this pandemic, uh, but we have to have shorter term solutions and masks do that for us right now today when you're going to the grocery store, when you're going to work, they can stop the spread of infection immediately. What do you want people in your yeah, area I, to know? Oh, go ahead, Dr. Archer. Yeah, if I can jump in on this because, you know, when we drop the mass protocols that were then required, it was almost ironic that the folks that were still wearing masks in their in the grocery stores and so forth were often the fully vaccinated folks because they uh, cared about it and were doing it. And then the unvaccinated who were never supposed to drop and stop wearing masks, they stopped. So it became too difficult to try to say, well, are we gonna have everybody have to wear a passport on their COVID vaccination to enter every place 
So really the only practical way to get this uh, epidemic back under control until people get vaccinated is to have everybody wear masks again. And then as I mentioned earlier, uh, unfortunately, people who are fully vaccinated can occasionally get this virus and not know they have it and spread it to others. So um, it is good for everybody to wear their masks. Julianne, what message are you sending to your community about testing, incentives for testing and getting vaccinated? Where, where do you want people to know to go? Sure, so we're still operating our mass vaccination site out on a State Avenue in Wyandotte County, and we're conducting both testing and vaccinations there. Um, I wanna echo what Dr. Hawkins said about the importance of testing right now. We're back where we were you know, at the start and in our, in our waves during the pandemic where we have got to identify those cases so that we can isolate them and we can quarantine those folks who are exposed. And so testing is of paramount importance again right now as we're trying to reduce again that uncontrolled community spread. So we're really trying to push that as hard as we can. Again, if it's a tickle in your throat, I would recommend you go ahead and get tested. There's a lot of places where you can go to, uh, to do that right now, and it's become easier and easier, and results and turnaround times are relatively quick. So we want folks to get tested, and of course, we need folks to get vaccinated. Again, it is the only long-term solution to, to finding our way out of this pandemic, and we're really hopeful we can get another wave of folks vaccinated before we enter these winter months, because in all honesty, we don't know what variant is coming next. And if you add a variant worse than the Delta and pile that on top, on top of influenza and on top of the fact that we move indoors in the winter, we could be really setting ourselves up for a catastrophic uh, late fall and winter again, just like last year. So uh, the time is now. If you've waited till now to see if it's safe, the time is now to get uh, your inoculation, finish your full series before we get in any further into the fall months. Any other reporter questions on the line today? Okay. Hi guys, it's Keep Taylor at 41. Hey I have a Taylor. couple, that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Um, so the first question I have, and both of these have to do with kind of um, rebutting claims that we hear from viewers and that kind of thing. The first one I wanted to ask about, um, people asking us uh, are saying that the vaccine causes the variant the Delta variant or the Lambda variant or whatever we're discussing, whichever variants are coming up. And you talked about mutation earlier, Dr. Archer. Um, how do we respond whenever we get those questions and what should we say? Do, do the vaccines cause in any way the variants to, to crop up? That's my first question. After you answer that, I'll answer the second one. So actually it's people that aren't getting vaccinated, which is causing the variants because the more people that become infected with this virus, the more the virus has a chance to mutate. So it's actually just the opposite. Of, and that's the problem with a lot of these rumors that are going on out there. Um, if you're not seeing this from a credible source, if it's not from the CDC, if it's not a group of medical doctors um, that are making the recommendation as opposed to one or two individuals that seem to be out there causing a lot of harm by all kinds of crazy um, scenarios that are being pushed out there. Uh, vaccinations are safe. They're so much safer than getting this disease. Um, and in fact, uh, if you've got any questions, ask your own doctor whether you should be getting the vaccine or not. Um, in fact, more and more doctor's offices are now making sure they've got the vaccine there so that they can actually give it to when folks come in for other purposes. Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more of just an answer of just a lack of no, uh, understanding and knowledge about viruses in general and the immune system. But even more than that, I mean, I think if you look back to the early parts of the pandemic, when we had that initial variant that arose, uh, that D614G, which is just a, a mutation in the spike which they detected, that was prior to any vaccination. If you look at what on with, uh, went on with India and the Delta variant, there was absolutely no vaccines in the, at that time in India. Or if you look at South Africa, there was no vaccines uh, prompting these variants to arise. To Dr. Archer's point, exactly. When you have people who are unvaccinated and you have more viral replication, you have the chance to identify and create those variants that may become more fit. And even in that host, may uh, over replicate or out compete the other viruses. And so therefore they are able to spread from one person to another. It's those immunosuppressed patients, which are at the most vulnerable 
for severe disease, which don't have a way to fight off the virus. So they have continued viral replication. They have that chance to create these variants that then can outcompete the other viruses that are in that human body and then spread from one person to another. So um, I think it's just that simple question of, or the answer of just a, a lack of knowledge about basic science in general and medicine in general. Taylor? My second question was about uh, masks in schools, and I, I, I meant to ask this yesterday morning whenever we had the, the Children's Mercy Doctors on, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to ask about um, there is uh, a lot of response, especially from parents who do not want to see masks in schools, about the negative impacts of children wearing masks. This is not to be a one-size-fits-all question because obviously there are some kids um, that masks mean different things for, whether it be a learning disability or a different kind of special need, but just on the whole, is there any data that that lays out some of the real, some or some of, or if there are any real concerns to children's children wearing masks long term? If there's a physical thing, an educational thing, developmental, anything at all that over the course of the last year that we have seen is a negative thing for children wearing masks long term. Um, you know, I'll start with, you know, I'm, there, I'm sure maybe there is a study. We can find studies for anything. We found studies saying that hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin or ivermectin help and cause benefit. Uh, but the overwhelming majority for those things and for masking, there is no significant published studies. There is no significant data saying that masking on children causes harm. And again, with the caveats of those populations that you had kind of selected out for, for sure, there is absolutely no data to suggest uh, that you are doing overall uh, widespread damage to children's psyche. I think it's more important that they are in school. I think that does more damage to children than anything. And also that can affect uh, the family household as well, the dynamics there. If children are in school, we know that it is uh, hard to get um, hard to get daycare and so maybe children have to be home with their parents so the parents can't go to work and that can affect the family dynamics as, as well so I think it's most important to keep the kids in the school we know it can keep uh, the children the households and those adults in the school safe we should continue to do that any other questions that's all for me thank you thanks Taylor okay the community is on fire today. They have tons of questions coming in. So I'm just going to start yeah, asking these real quick um, and see how many we can get to. So a question it came in from uh, Joe. He's a member of the Olathe School Board, uh, and I'd like everyone to um, jump in on this. But he tries to watch us every morning to, to get some of this information. But he would really like us to address several myths that anti-mask parents keep repeating about masking and the coronavirus in general so that people have one place to get this information and mm. just say, this is what you're hearing and this is what the truth is. Uh, Dr. Hawkinson, can you get us started on that? What are a few things you're hearing that you really want to clear up? You know, I mean, I think the things that we have heard that it causes children emotional distress and they can't do it. And actually what we have seen anecdotally um, is that kids can actually do better than adults and they don't seem to mind. Uh, the other thing is that you will get new infections if you are wearing a mask for many hours a day. Uh, all these things, again, are wholly untrue. We have to understand, you know, also who is recommending the mask? Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their one goal, their one purpose, and people that spend their whole careers and lives looking out for children's safety has recommended mask use for children in those situations and especially in schools. We know that the CDC, whose sole job is to provide public health guidance to keep the American uh, Americans healthy, they are recommending masks in those situations as well. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand what are the sources that you are getting this information from. Is it the people who dedicate their lives, who dedicate countless hours despite backlash and despite um, you know uh, other attacks to do the right thing for medical purposes, to keep you and your family safe, to keep the children safe, 
or is it somebody who's on uh, Facebook or TikTok or Snapchat with their opinions because they've done a lot of, quote, internet research, unquote. So I think it's important to understand who is your source and where are you getting that information from. And we always have to go back to those people that do dedicate their lives and put so much information, uh, time and energy into looking at all the information and data. And so it starts again. If we're talking about children, we're starting with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Also looking at the CDC the state health departments, uh, the county health departments, the people who are doing this every day, day in and day out, really to keep you and me safe, to keep the general public safe. Dr. Archer, can you bust some myths for us? So I think in general, there are lots of things that happen in social media that are not true. And there are various ways to check to see whether something is true before you spread it to somebody else. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't do that. If it already fits into your self-conceived idea or what you want to hear, then you don't have the right filters on. So if you don't want to fool with masks or you're hearing folks that think, well, wearing masks is, is anti-American or whatever that bias may be, then you're listening for those kinds of things. Um, major study was done showing that it's really just a dozen people that are generating most of this negativity around vaccinations and masks. And so if you're listening to a source that is saying some of these things, then you need to stop listening to that source, period. Don't let it influence you. Um, as the doctor said, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, these are all the national pediatricians who come together, weigh the issues and odds, and make their recommendations known to folks. Listen to the Children's Mercy doctors. Um, that's where we need to be. Um, there are folks that just are trying to sow dissension in our communities and to tear us apart. And uh, all these myths, uh, in fact, even in many cases, repeating the myth is a problem because people hear it and want to believe it. Um, so I just want to say, why are the places that could be the most outbreak oriented, which would be our hospitals in regards to where the sickest patients that are shedding the most virus, and we're not having outbreaks there. It's because they're wearing masks. We weren't having outbreaks there even before we had vaccination. So protect your kids, help them wear masks. They're adaptable. They learn, as it was said, they're actually many times uh, better and willing to wear masks because uh, in some cases, it's easier to keep kids' masks on than it is their shoes and socks. Mm -hmm. That's a really good mm -hmm. point. <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, Ryan has a question about getting flu vaccines this year. Dr. Mm -hmm. Hawkinson, start us out with this, because last year there was a big push to get them in September. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Ryan says he would normally get his in October. Are you giving those same recommendations to people? And what about going back to school? Should parents go ahead and get mm -hmm. the flu vaccine now? Yeah, you know, um, so I think the official guidance from the CDC is that when a, uh, when a influenza vaccine is available and you have a chance to get it, go ahead and get it. Um, I certainly uh, recommend for my pa patients maybe getting it later in the year, and this depends on what the influenza dynamics are right now uh, you know, in the community or that particular time. So I, would, I always suggest getting it maybe later in October, early November, and by that time you'll still have that six months of immunity that we know the, the flu vaccine offers. We know the flu vaccine is quite different than the coronavirus vaccines and that their immunity is fairly short-lived. So I think right now with the influenza dynamics in the United States, it is extremely low activity. Uh, but again, now we have restrictions that are gone. Masking is gone. Um, in addition, if you look at the RSV, we have seen this surge back. And this is similar to what happened in Australia when they did see a new surge six to nine months later than the regular surge because those masking restrictions had lifted. Right now, I looked the other day in Australia, and I believe at the year to date, they've only had 430 some uh, lab confirmed 
uh, cases of influenza. So right now they still have very low number of cases and we typically follow what the Southern Hemisphere does. So I think at this point in time, you can really look to get your influenza vaccine maybe in October, later October, or the, at the earliest, early no, or at the latest, early November. But I think we need to keep a handle on what is gonna be happening with the infections, the rates of influenza uh, in our community. And again, right now, there is uh, very, very low activity. But as we have seen with RSV, uh, with the surge in coronavirus, with the lifting of all these mandates and restrictions, it could certainly surge back pretty quickly. So I think in the next few weeks, two to three to four weeks, we'll just keep an eye on what the flu activity is. We're gonna to get to community questions here in just a moment. Julianne, though, real quick, what kind of challenges are you facing um, in your county as far as schools and getting schools and parents and everyone on the same page? What are you hearing? Sure, so a lot of those same myths that we talked about, um, and unfortunately, we're still hearing the myth that COVID just doesn't affect our kiddos, and that's not true. Somewhere between four and 500 uh, pediatric deaths have occurred due to COVID in, in the United States since the pandemic began, many of those before uh, the Delta variant. And as we know, the Delta variant has changed the entire game and how we approach this. So we're still trying to stamp out that um, bit of misinformation that is still running wild on some corners of Facebook, unfortunately. And we're even been hearing, you know, last Thursday night at our commission meeting, we had open public comment, and I was surprised by the number of folks who were still clinging to the idea that masks simply don't work, uh, which we know after decades and decades and decades of physicians wearing them in operating rooms and uh, various countries using them um, for things like battling influenza, et cetera, that they are just extremely um, effective. So really it's that misinformation uh, that both of the doctors talked about that continues to kind of run wild. And um, unfortunately, our mask mandate uh, here in Wyandotte County does not apply to our school districts, so they do have authority to make their own uh, requirements or guidelines. And so that is what has us a bit concerned going into the next few weeks for sure. Yeah, still a lot of work to do, it sounds like. Uh, we have got a lot of community questions coming in, so I want everyone to know I'm, I'm sifting through them. I'm going to hold them also some of these for follow up Friday. So if we don't get to them, but um, I do want to ask Nancy's question because Dr. Archer, you brought up credible sources earlier. So to Dr. Hawkinson, and she wants to know, is the scientific advisory for emergencies a credible source? She, uh, they recently published an article um, that she was curious about and just wanted to make sure that that's a good place to get info. Um, I'm actually not familiar with them. Um, I'm not sure whether any of our KU docs um, yeah. are. Dr. Hawkinson, are you familiar with that? Or could we look into that? No, um, it looks like the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. Yes. Yeah. Okay, look into that, and um, Nancy will It looks will like get... a UK group, so we can certainly look into okay. that. Okay, Nancy, we'll get back to you on that. Um, let's ask this. Jean has a question, and I just want you to clarify if this is true or not, Dr. Hawkinson. He says, since cloth masks, cloth masks are only 20% effective mm -hmm. and procedural masks are 40% effective and vaccinations do not take full effect for six weeks, mm -hmm. should the primary emphasis now be on quality of masking, distancing, and contact tracing and testing, kind of like what we saw last year? First of all, the, quali the uh, percentage of mask yeah. effectiveness, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't focus so much on that. Again, we're kind of going back to what we've done the past um, year and a half. I would certainly um, defer to our experts, uh, expert guests right now. But again, what we said originally was the masks, more importantly, provide a barrier for you if you are expressing the virus into the environment. This will help block some of that expression. Uh, but it does offer that benefit of helping the wearer as well to filter out some of those droplets and those viruses as well. The numbers have been variable. Those are, are certainly um, some of the numbers that have been thrown out as far as the amount of protection any certain mask gives you. And that goes from cloth mask to surgical procedural mask or the N95 mask. But I think the overall goal is still to block expression of the virus, of those droplets into the environment. But the mask also does um, give you, the wearer, some benefit of protection as well. Uh, Michael wants to know, he says, Dr. Fauci has mentioned antiviral pills a few times over the mm -hmm. past six months. Do you know where we are with those? Yeah, those are still in uh, very early <laughs> trials. Um, 
there are a couple oral pills that are, are that are being investigated right now, but um, I don't see those coming to market any time within the next six to nine months. Uh, but they are still in the active trials and they are still being developed, and I'm sure that there are more in the pipeline as well. Isaac wants to know, how long will it take for the recent increase in vaccinations to translate to an effect that we see in the case data, especially now with the Kansas City mask mandate? Dr. Archer, what are your predictions? So, and I'm going to back up on the wearing of masks and the effectiveness of the other masks and then move back to this question because Obviously, if the person breathes through their nose and the mask is not covering their nose, uh, it's not going to be very effective regardless of what type it is. So, you know, continuing to help people with subtle reminders um, if their mask has dropped down and they don't notice it um, is important. Um, there is even evidence that in some cases, quote, double masking is useful because to get a better seal. Um, if I was extremely worried and wasn't um, fully vaccinated, um, I would actually shave my beard off because I can't get as good a seal with most masks because of the beard. Um, so, uh, but if, if I'm in a setting, if I'm gonna be traveling, which I have not yet on a plane, I will probably double mask and or have to shave my beard to make sure that I have a good tight seal. Um, you know, the KN95s, if you can get those, are uh, better fitting. But I also can tell you that there are a lot of tricks to sometimes taking loops over the ears and kind of flipping them so that you make it a little tighter and get it up in a position to where it stays and protects you uh, more effectively. Any mask that you will wear is useful, but some of these that are like scarves uh, really haven't been shown to be very effective. And so I really prefer the surgical masks or the uh, KN95s that folks can get those. When it comes to outbreaks, um, we have seen that when we put in the masking order and we in Wyandotte County were the first two jurisdictions last year to put those into place, we saw a substantial impact on reductions of cases. Now that was with the previous uh, COVID without this Delta variant, but we are hoping to at least slow down the increase. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be enough it really depends on compliance. Um, and we are starting to go out and deal with uh, establishments that aren't requiring folks to wear masks. Yet. Um, I really still think OSHA needs to take a stand and mandate them um, as a workplace safety issue for all employees, uh, both for the employees as well as customers who are in indoor environments. And I'd like to see OSHA also um, move towards uh, strong encouragement or mandating of vaccinations. Um, because if we can do both of those, we can get this under control and get back to more normality. Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, you know, just a cursory look at that SAGE group. It looks like a uh, UK government website. So just looking on that, I would say it's probably a reliable source. But again, also understand that the infection dynamics, uh, vaccination, all that kind of stuff is a little bit different in the UK than it is here. But so far, on just a uh, preliminary look, it looks like it's probably a legitimate website. So I have a question about these uh, quick turnaround tests. Uh, Sharon wants to know, do you feel the quick turnaround time for the testing is accurate? Do you feel comfortable with that? And what should we do if we get, uh, you always say if it's a, a positive, it's a positive, it's a negative, maybe get a different type of test? Um, yeah, I'll kind of defer to, uh, to Julianne too. You know, I, I would assume that this is an antigen test where they're doing the quick turnaround time. And again, I think it depends what the company is, what that exact platform is. Um, you know, again, I think if it's positive, it's a uh, it's a reliable uh, it's a reliable test. If it's negative, I think you still need a confirmatory uh, PCR just to make sure that it is negative. If that if that answers the question, Julianne. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, we do advocate for using those quick turnaround tests in business places, for example, for surveillance testing. So if you're testing all of your workforce once a week, for example, just to keep an eye on how spread is going in your workplace and make sure that you stamp out any of those potential clusters before they get too big, that's a good use of that test. But if you're looking for diagnostic testing, wanting to make sure if you're symptomatic or been exposed, mm. we really do want folks to get that PCR test. But I agree, if you get that quick uh, antigen test result and it's negative, I would probably follow up with the PCR test. But if it's positive, then that's, I would presume, positive. We also have to remember that a PCR test could be negative because it was done too early. Um, and so sometimes, um, you know, if you know you've had a significant exposure, getting that test three to five days later makes sense, but it doesn't mean you are out of the woods. And so um, I prefer to just have everybody assume that they actually have the virus, whether they have it or not, and that your job is to wear a mask and not spread it to other people. Um, yes, it's helpful sometimes to get the testing, but if you just assume that you've got the virus and do the right things to keep it from spreading, we can get control of this outbreak. It's also important to note that CDC recently made a recommendation change regarding testing for vaccinated folks who are exposed. So previously, if you were fully vaccinated and exposed to a confirmed COVID case, case you didn't have to uh, quarantine or get tested. Now, they're still not asking you to quarantine, but they are now asking you to get tested five to seven days past exposure, even again, if you're vaccinated. So that's a significant change for some of us who are vaccinated and something to keep in mind if we've been to an event or been in a workplace where people have tested positive we do need to follow up and get tested ourselves. Yeah, it's like going back a year ago. That's what that's the advice was just to wear a mask and assume mm -hmm. that you could have it when testing wasn't widely available. So that's a really good point. Um, Amy wants to know, she says many districts who are not requiring masks are not um, making accommodations for lunch. Uh, students will be unmasked and not socially distanced. It's going to look a little different this year. Is this a concern? Is this a valid concern as a parent? Um, Julianne, just your thoughts. Uh, what are you hearing um, regarding the districts? It is a valid concern. Um, you know, it's our same concern with restaurants and bars being open is that you can't wear a mask while you're eating, obviously. Um, there are ways to help mitigate that risk or at least lessen it to some extent. It's really becomes about that social distancing. How big of a room do you have uh, a number of kids eating in? Um, there are ways to make sure that you don't send six groups of classrooms into the cafeteria at once by either eating in your own classroom six feet apart or while the weather is warm, taking lunch outside. We really like that idea if that's possible. So. Yes, it is one of the more risky um, things to do within the school settings unmasked, but there are ways to lessen that risk. And I think a lot of the school districts are taking that piece seriously because again, even the kids who, whose parents are sending them in masks voluntarily can't keep that mask on to eat and drink. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, you know, a lot of the districts are basically saying, okay, we know that our classroom is too crowded to maintain social distancing with the masks off and eating there. So if we break the class basically in half and half the folks stay in the class and eat there and half go down to the cafeteria and can be spread out, then you're reducing the risk. Um, and kids tend to eat fairly fast anyway. Um, and so you try to get them to get that done and get the mask back on. Okay, so Sean says, if you have been vaccinated and get COVID with the Delta variant, is your immunity different? Do you have stronger immunity? If you have been vaccinated and then get- If you've had it, get vaccinated. Is your immunity stronger? Is it different? Um, I, I don't know that we have any evidence that it's necessarily stronger. If, if you had natural infection and then you got vaccinated, there is uh, you know, evidence and data to suggest that you have higher antibody levels. You might have some sort of boost in your T cell response as well. Um, and so you know, there was that argument being made that if you've had COVID-19 in the past, and you just need then one dose of mRNA vaccine, uh, but there is no recommendation or guidance for that. Um, so I think that's important to note. Uh, the recommendation is to still, even if you've ever had COVID-19, 
to get vaccinated and become fully vaccinated again, either with the two dose mRNA vaccines or the single dose Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Okay, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. Megan says, what can be done if you end up testing positive to help prevent becoming more ill and needing hospitalization? I'm assuming that means if she's been vaccinated, mm -hmm. test positive, what are your thoughts? Dr. Hawkinson, do you know that one? I would say nothing. It's that preventive area before you get infected, and that is getting vaccination. Right now, there is no uh, significant uh, outpatient treatment, uh, any pills you can take. Certainly, if you are in that high-risk category and you are not yet considered fully vaccinated, we can still give you the monoclonal antibody therapy, which will significantly reduce your chance of progressing to having to go to the hospital. Again, if you meet criteria to get that. But otherwise, uh, if you have gotten the disease, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, there's really nothing that you can take other than the simple things that we've talked about rest, fluids, nutrition, doing those types of things. Okay, one last question. Well, Jennifer says Dr. Hawkinson should write a book about his experience with the pandemic. We'll talk about <laughs> that later, okay? And then I need Dr. Archer to look into his crystal ball and tell us, mm. is it too late to have a good holiday season? It's never too late to have a good holiday season, <laughs> but whether or not that holiday season will be like we normally had two years ago, I think we'll have to see. Um, uh, it, it really depends on do we get another variant that's even more contagious and may be more of a challenge? Do folks comply with the mask orders and more and more of those that have been on the fence and just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I had a clerical person one time give me a round to it with to it spelled on it. Um, you know, people need to get around to it uh, to get vaccinated. <laughs> and if we have enough folks vaccinated um, coming into these holiday seasons, um, but they are more challenging, particularly when we have crowded environments in people's homes for uh, various holidays uh, in the winter when you can't go out on the back deck. So um, I, I'm, I'm concerned still that we may have one more year here where we've gotta be extra, extra careful during the holiday seasons. Um, we know that uh, we can put hospitals on real challenges during the holiday seasons because some of their staff obviously deserve and want to take vacation time and be with family. So it's hard to staff even without the outbreak or a pandemic. And then you add um, that we didn't have much flu last year and we could have much more this year on top of COVID. So no, I think we'll still probably at least one more year before we can have a, a relatively more normal um, holiday season. I think what I hear you saying is it's up to us what it's going to look like over the next year or two. So thank you for that. Um, I want to get to our final thoughts, but I want our viewers to know I'm literally taking down every single question and they are good ones. So I'm going to hang on to these. And again, we're going to do those on follow up Friday. So thank you for sending those in today. Um, but Dr. Archer, I'm just going to start with you. What are your final thoughts? What do you want us to know as we head out today? Um, we are social beings and reducing our social interactions can be very challenging. Um, we need a core group of folks that are vaccinated, that we spend time with, um, and that we know are going to be careful about their exposures because we need that social contact. Um, on the flip side, we're also social beings where folks that are kind of related to us in different ways do have some influence. You know, you don't walk into a bar in most places in, in the Kansas City metro area and light up a cigarette without everybody looking at you like, what the heck are you doing? Um, we need that same social pressure um, in a positive way, not antagonistic, let's be civil, but let's encourage folks share that you've been vaccinated, encourage other folks to get it done. Um, let's be a community together and protect those vulnerable folks, those folks that 
have medical problems and they can't get fully strength um, from their vaccines. And it, it you know, and, and the children that are under 12 that can't be vaccinated yet, we need to protect them. Dr. Archer, thank you so much for being with us today. And we really appreciate your message and your wonderful insights. So join us again, please. Julianne, thank you for joining us too. What are your uh, final thoughts as we head out today? Sure, a couple things. I think first, I wanna give a nod to the many businesses just in the last 10 days who have made announcements requiring vaccines among their uh, workforce. I think that's pivotal. I think from a public health perspective, large, large employers starting to make this shift requiring vaccinations is going to be, a, can be a game changer for us if enough move in that direction. The federal government, if local governments do the same, uh, we can get a lot more people vaccinated that way. And so we wanna to continue to encourage that. Um, and then lastly, just what Dr. Archer was saying, as difficult as this is, we are still in this together. We are still a human race that relies on one another to achieve health and wellness as a community. And um, a lot of us have unfortunately made a lot of decisions based solely on our own risk factors for me and myself, rather than maybe those people around us. So we wanna keep echoing or putting out that rallying cry that there are a lot of people around us that you, maybe they look healthy and they look just fine, but you don't know what conditions they have. You don't know who they live with. You don't know how many kids under 12 they have. And so we just ask people to continue to consider their neighbors and their decision-making. Great having you today, Julianne. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, uh, you know, I wanna thank our guests for, for being here today. Again, uh, two people whose, uh, you know, career and motivation is to keep the public healthy, whether it's Kansas City, Missouri, or Wyandotte County. Um, understand who your sources are that you're getting your information from. And also, you know, understand exactly what way are you coming about, how you are trying to form your opinions about the pandemic itself. Is it the pure medical and public health guidance? Uh, that seems to, what draw, to be what draws more people, people's ire than anything. Um, we know that there are other aspects to life, as, as we have just learned, uh, but those things are not mutually exclusive to the pandemic and public health and medical guidance either. If we do things right from the medical standpoint and the public health standpoint, we can keep our economy open. We can keep lessened restrictions. We can keep doing the gatherings and getting together. They are not mutually exclusive. In fact, if we do it correctly, uh, it'll be a, a much better synergy. We'll be able to keep things going as we would like. So I think it's important to understand that. Who are you listening to? What is their main motivation? But if we're talking about the economy and keeping doing things and being social, um, the medical advice, the public health guidance, you know, is not mutually exclusive to all these other things. We can do them if we do them in a thoughtful manner and do that. Um, so I'd also like to thank Dr. Archer. You know, he was my boss. Um, probably, let's see, 1999 to 2001, when I worked uh, in Ron Griffin's office in uh, infectious disease and infectious disease investigation. I think he had just kind of come to the post as well. So uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. That's a good little nugget of information. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks to all of our guests. Dr. Hawkinson, we appreciate you. Again, lots of shout outs to you today. Just really appreciating you being here every day. All right. got to start working on that book. <laughs> got to start marketing that book. All right. So tomorrow, movie, Doc maybe. <laughs> Dr. Stites is back. I'm just keeping his chair warm. It's open mics with Dr. Stites. We're going to hear from the Satterwhites. Dr. Catherine Satterwhite, Regional Health Administrator for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, on the importance of getting vaccinated and protecting those around you and Dr. Lewis Satterwhite with the different treatments available for those fighting COVID right now. So that is tomorrow morning. We will see you at 8 a.m. Make it a great Tuesday.